Okay, so Pat, thank you so much again for taking the time to come onto the podcast. Well, thank you. It's a, it's always a pleasure to be able to participate in these, and uh, I, I hope we can get into some really cool discussions. I, I hope so. So, uh, you know, give the listeners just a bit of a, a rundown on who you are and, and what it is you currently do. Sure. Uh, my name is Pat Davidson, and I have a master's degree in strength and conditioning and a PhD in exercise physiology. I worked in uh, academia for five years. I worked at uh, Brooklyn College in New York City, and I worked at Springfield College in Massachusetts. And uh, I was primarily focused on, on trying to educate up-and-coming uh, professionals that would be personal trainers and strength and conditioning coaches, particularly at, at Springfield College, which is kind of referred to as the cradle of coaches. And there's a lot of, um, you know, ambitious and, and, and great young minds that are always there as students who are going to be the next generation of, of strength and conditioning coaches in the United States. So um, I, I really enjoyed the process of, of teaching and interacting with students um, and also just kind of the hands-on parts. Like while I was at Springfield College, I, um, you know, I was the coach for, for what we called Springfield College Team Iron Sports, which was a, a mixed group of, of uh, strongman competitors, power lifters, Olympic lifters, CrossFitters, and bodybuilders. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all trained at the same time. And uh, there was some, some crossover where we did some things all at the same time. And then we would split in terms of the specific resistance training. But our largest group was our strongman competitors. And I competed with, with those guys. And uh, we had a number of, of young men um, really excel. And they're continuing to excel in, in the sport of strongman. Um, you know, we had Rob Kearney, who is currently competing, uh, you know, at the highest level at World's Strongest Man and the Arnold Classic. And... Um, you know, he, he actually was just on the Joe Rogan experience last week. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's really blossoming and, and uh, becoming kind of a superstar in that sport. Mm -hmm. And uh, also uh, the Hadge brothers, uh, Zach Hadge and Nick Hadge. And they, they recently competed over in, in the UK at uh, the World's uh, Strongman Team Championship. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and they're like uh, two of the more interesting people that you'll ever encounter in your life and it's almost like they're uh they're pro wrestlers at, at heart in some ways right uh, but I, I i really i really loved uh those guys who have become the most prominent uh people that were part of that team but yeah. but so many other other young men and and women that that were part of that group and uh you know but uh, following uh, working in academia and, and, and doing that, I, I came down to New York City to work in the private sector. And, you know, like things never go in the exact trajectory that you expect them to go in. But um, I'm currently uh, just a, an independent uh, person. I, I run my own personal training business in, in New York City. Uh, and at the same time, I, I get a chance to be able to, to be an author. I get a chance to be able to do presentations and put seminars together. Mm -hmm. um, and I get a chance to, to go down entrepreneurial ventures and, and I'm, I'm trying to launch a, a piece of technology that would be able to, to help score resistance training uh, programs or, or workouts for people and, and then guide them quantitatively um, you know, uh, with what would be appropriate for, for loading schemes going forward from a program design standpoint. All right. Cool. What does the uh, what does the process of that look like so far? Or are you, are you not giving too much away? <laughs> no, I, 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 I've never been someone that kind of shies away from giving away information. I always I like, you know, kind of an open book in terms of my program design philosophies, my biomechanics design philosophies, uh, you know, because I've always said, here's all of my information explained mm -hmm. in every possible detail. Go do it. Go try to do it. I encourage you. I, I don't want it, anything to ever like information is free mm -hmm. to me. And, um, you know, I would rather see something quote unquote get ripped off from me if it makes the like the world of exercise a better place for you know, seeing in, in the big picture, like more humans doing more quality uh, fitness development stuff so that mm -hmm. we as a species are in a better place. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah. you know, basically it's, it's kind of like, um, 
it's starting with Kaiser equipment with pneumatic resistance. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what I'm going to be doing with that is uh, that I'm going, like if you're familiar with using Kaiser equipment, it is able to score each rep. And right. it gives you a power score for that rep. Mm -hmm. so that it takes into account the load and the velocity that it moved at and the range of motion it moved through. Sure. And, but it, it really only shows you like one rep at a time and maybe it'll show you the percentage of your best rep for the follow-up reps. But um, what, what I'm doing is, is uh, creating some technology that links every piece together. Uh, can you close that door, please? Yeah. And, um, and once the the pieces are linked together to a central mainframe you're going to be able to see a scoreboard that's building up your accumulated uh power through your workout as you go through it right okay. so uh it's essentially like you know that'll be version one of it and ultimately i hope to create uh versions down the road but it's it's almost like um you know, if you if you just look at load management overall within sports science and, and exercise science, you know, oftentimes you'll see it with a GPS and you can see how far someone ran in practice and the number of meters that they ran at a certain velocity. This would be a very similar kind of thing for the weight room mm -hmm. where you could see uh, the total work that someone performed for all resistance training combined. Mm -hmm. And then you'd be able to see the total work uh, performed with each piece of equipment. But then you'd also be able to differentiate and break down to seeing uh, the total amount of power that people were able to create with uh, their overall resistance training, as well as the total power from each individual uh, station that they were training at. Yeah. And then you'd be so, able to see that throughout the session as well, like how things get slower exactly. and degrade. Exactly. So you'd have something to compare to. And it also takes into account things for like, you know, a taller athlete. Mm -hmm. versus a shorter athlete because not all it's it's different if, if it's moving through a greater total range of motion or uh it's it's kind of like the, if the velocity is different i think you probably have different training effects uh if someone is is moving load at completely different velocities mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm i'm very curious as to like what happens with that but i also am fully i, I think that um it's almost like the general sense in my opinion is that most humans do a really bad job of actually tracking their resistance training volume right uh, whether or not they you know most people say they do and then they don't really do it and and particularly like the general population like mm -hmm. they just kind of go in and they do stuff and um and i think that once people are actually given a visual presentation of what they did now they have something to compare to going forward and as they go forward, they can witness themselves either making progress or not making progress. And then they can ask appropriate questions about, hey, why am I not making progress? And that usually is the thing that kind of peels the layers of the onion back for people. And you discover like, uh, oh, your sleep is terrible and your nutrition is all over the place. And you had, you know, 15 beers last night and this, that and the other thing. But it's like people aren't even cognizant of the fact that their lifestyle influences their physical output mm -hmm. until they're presented with scores and i've always kind of said like school probably mattered for the majority of people much less before the report card existed mm -hmm. and once a report card came into play then all of a sudden um school and grades become much more important people take it more seriously mm -hmm. it's the old saying of uh what gets measured gets managed yeah and um you know I, I, if you work with people, you know, they do their set of squats or something along those lines and they ask you after, was that good? And, and you're like, eh, I don't, I mean, yeah, it was what it was. Like you squatted it, but all of a sudden, like there's a more clear cut and dry answer after they do their set. And it's like, was that good? It's like, well, it was that number right there. And mm -hmm. that number takes into account like your range of motion and your velocity and the weight. Mm -hmm. And if you see that number go up, it's probably a result of one of those factors being changed in the appropriate direction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's um, even if you work with athletes or general population, you realize most of them have the same kinds of problems where it's like, uh, you know, they don't bring the right intent to the way that they lift weights. It's like, they just kind of go through the motions mm -hmm. and it's like, Hey, the goal that we're trying to get at here is that I want you to lift this thing 
and move it with significant velocity on the concentric part of this. And they kind of do, but not really. But as soon as you give them a quantitative score, all mm -hmm. of a sudden you can see their eyes change. Yeah. And it's like the next time they, they see a number and it's like, hey, do you think you could beat that number? And boom, all of a sudden it's like there's a much greater output put into it. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you go to the fair and you have that hammer and you try to ring the bell by hitting the thing. And everybody wants to do it now and beat the other person because it's visual, it's demonstrated. So mm -hmm. uh, an element of competition and, and an element of visual demonstration of what people actually did, I think, is, is a major game changer um, for effort. And then tracking things is a great thing for adherence. And if you can combine effort and adherence, then that's probably 90% of the things that are lacking in most people's uh, resistance training. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's, um, it adds another level of progression as well, because you talked about people not really measuring their, their total volume. And so you were like, if we can actually get a system together that shows people their total volume in power, velocity, and, and in total tonnage as well, they've mm -hmm. then got so many, they've got a way to objectively measure their progression and a way to say, you could say, right, well, we're not going to add load on the bar this week, but we'll aim to lift it faster. And then that's, exactly. that's your method of regression that week. Yeah, there's more, there's more targets to hit, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and hitting a target is really a marker of, of, uh, of that's what we're trying to accomplish. And, it, you know, uh, I've got a good friend, Jim Ferris, who works out of Philadelphia, and, and I routinely hear him say, like, hey, nobody ever quit the gym because they were making progress and having amazing results. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, it's, it's when people are, are stagnant and they're not seeing that they're going anywhere, that they get frustrated, and that usually is what leads to, to lack of adherence and, and consistency. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that uh, kind of as, as most people know, it's that consistency and adherence and consistently bringing a quality effort to it that will actually give people results. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, you know, we, we always, like, we're probably going to get into some nitty gritty pieces when it comes to mechanics and fine details of exercise. But for the vast majority of humans that exercise, the main variables that are the targets are consistency, adherence, and effort. Mm. And, and if I can kind of come in with one tool that should provide that for more people, then I'm, I'm very happy with that as an outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cause people, it comes down to people actually, as you said, tracking what they're doing and, and taking note of it, but then also being consistent. I think people, they, they might, miss days because of one thing or another and then because it's not their ideal plan they then throw it all out of the window or they're not seeing progress they think they should be seeing because they're not measuring other ways of making progress and then they right. change program because they're like well this isn't working for me and you kind of get this constant spinning of a wheel i guess of people in a certain area yeah and a lot of times people add load and that decreases range of motion for instance right yeah um and it's like well we didn't really make progress. Like I watched what you did, but like you <laughs> are claiming progress. But the reality is, is that it's, it's actually now not, we're not comparing apples to apples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and that's, that's always frustrating uh, when, when that is happening for people because they're not really receiving the truth as feedback. No. Cause as you said, they've just accommodated their movement pattern in order to lift bigger load but yeah. then, then and, the, and the equation's different. <laughs> exactly. And, and typically I, I would say like, uh, you know, I've, I've coached plenty of people and, and like, uh, you know, I always, I always kind of, I, when I'm coaching people, particularly as coaches that also want to be competitive um, within the realm of, of, uh, you know, it's almost like a lot of guys are, are fitness professionals and maybe compete in a, in, in powerlifting or something else. And, and I, I will oftentimes work with those guys and try to mentor or something along uh, in that nature. Mm -hmm. and, and what I usually tell them is that the most important thing that we can do with you is, is to keep you from experiencing injury or sickness and, and to continuously move the needle in the positive direction. But I don't even care how much. Like as long as the needle is moving positively and you don't get hurt, that's the big picture because let's talk about what actually happens if you get hurt or you get sick. 
Mm. Like, let's say you get uh, something that prevents you from being able to train appropriately for a two week stretch. Mm -hmm. uh, now, all of a sudden, what we see is a significant regression of your numbers and your quantitative output. And then it's going to take an additional, uh, you know, let's say four weeks for you to train to get back up to the place where you were before this took place. And now it's going to take an additional four weeks after that to get up to the point where you're actually ahead of where you were before this took place. And mm -hmm. if you do the math on that, that's 10 total weeks. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that doesn't sound like a big deal to you, but if you think about it, you only have 52 weeks in a year mm -hmm. and 10 weeks out of 52 is somewhere around like 17 or 18%. You just lost out on, on 18% of your training year mm -hmm. in terms of your ability to make progress. And how many years do you really think you have to actually be able to drive this forward? You might only have 10 years. So you just lost out on, on potentially 1% of the totality of everything that would go into you being able to reach the highest levels that you can reach. Mm. So it's, um, it's always kind of like once people are able to, to understand like, like that time scale and the, the big picture of, of, um, of what their investment is and how much of their investment is taken out by something that they might consider minor, mm. then all of a sudden it's like, you know, because what actually ends up hurting people most likely is going to be load. You know, it's like it, chances are that they made too great of a jump or they tried to do something. It's like, ah, let me just test and see where I'm at. And, and that's where most people will get themselves in trouble. And it's like, congratulations. Now you've cost yourself, you know, at minimum 15% of your training year. Mm. And, and that's a really, really bad situation to put yourself in. Yeah. It's a great point. It's uh, more people should be, I guess, as you said, wary of that, the sake of pushing too hard in load and injuring themselves and then focus on progression in other areas rather than just adding load all the time. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the the big patterns because this is something that you're uh, you know become known for in this seminar that you're, you're teaching around the world. Talk talk us a bit about your viewpoint, I guess, on on creating that seminar at first. Yeah, um, so it, it really kind of started when I was teaching a seminar with um, it was co-taught by Bill Hartman and Doug Kachigian, and uh, you know I think that Bill is is someone that that I, for a lot of people in, in my sphere in the U S uh, he's someone that we all kind of point at as being um, kind of like the, the godfather or like the, the grand poobah, if you will, of, of like who we all look at is driving everything forward. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I would say that for me, like he's, he's probably uh, the person that I look up to the most and the person that I, when I have a question, he's who I ask. And it was a tremendous honor for me to present alongside him. Like that's probably something that I feel uh, more proud of than anything else that I've done. And during his presentation, he, he made the statement that, that everyone should write out their model, you know, their training model or their re rehabilitation model, whatever it is that is the model by which they operate on a day-to-day -day basis in their job, write it out. And he kind of paused and he was like, no, really write it out. <laughs> and, and really like, uh, it's funny because we, we, we think very differently from each other and the way that we create work is very different from each other. And like Bill likes to make flow charts and, uh, diagrams and, and drawings and things like that. And, and I, on, I really only operate in sentences and paragraphs and, and things like that. So mm -hmm. For me, like the process of trying to write out a model actually just ended up in, in first turning, turning it into a PowerPoint where it's kind of like I just organized the framework or the skeleton of something. And, and that PowerPoint ended up turning into the presentation that I started doing of rethinking the big patterns, number one. Mm -hmm. and, and it was kind of like, you know, I think in looking at it, it was, it, it was very interesting as a process because I, I started off with saying to myself, well, if I'm going to write out my model, it's almost like making a cookbook. 
and a cookbook should be something that that is done where if if I'm trying to like I would like someone to make the same product as me and and if they're in China they could be able to read this and have a rule book to follow so that I could have roughly the exact same outcome if someone else is working on the same person as, as what, they, what they would receive from me. Mm -hmm. like, so it was taking all of this implicit knowledge that I have that you know you do on a daily basis. It's like you're, you're just going through your day, you're, you're doing what you do and you don't even really think about it. And then it was like really pausing and breaking it down and thinking about like, uh, okay, here's what I do and why exactly do I do it this way? And, and as I went into that, it became a really interesting, almost like a game uh, for me of, of trying to prove myself wrong, mm -hmm. of making a statement and then having to defend that statement. Like I was cross-examining myself yeah. the entire time. Mm -hmm. and, and then it, was, it, it, it became something more. It became something different. It became something bigger as I kind of went through it. And, and I, I started to create like uh, essentially like, what I what I describe it as is it became the creation of a taxonomy of the world of exercise. Mm -hmm. So the most famous taxonomy that most people are aware of is is Carolus Linnaeus's Systema Naturae, where he created the you know the kingdoms of life and the phylums and the class and the order and the genus. Mm -hmm. And with that, it's it's because it's almost like as like from a we can. It, we're working from an implicit level most of the time when we're looking at animals and plants and things like that where there's names associated with these things like that's a cherry tree and that's a puma and that's a robin but it doesn't really describe what the thing is mm -hmm. um and and i think like with his brain he was like how do i how do i uh create categories that these that that animals that are very much like each other fall into um, and how do I make it so that there's like a kind of a nested structure or a, like a bucket inside of a bucket inside of another bucket that differentiates and what is the appropriate number of buckets and, and ultimately how is it that like we start from one central bucket of life and then it branches into these three and then those three branch into these. And, and, and so I tried to do a very similar thing with exercise mm -hmm. where I, I tried to create a, almost like an alphabet or something that could s spread from there. Um, and, and that's really what, what emerged from it was that there are all forms of exercise stress the body in some way, mm -hmm. but there are different forms of stress. And if, I, if I'm looking at, at a particular exercise, it's, it's the shape of the body as it's participating in the exercise. And it's the direction that the organism is moving while it is creating this specific shape that would lead to uh, differentiation. And this exercise being different than this exercise over here. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I tried to create like what would be the system for creating that kind of breakout. And, and it really started with like three realms of qualitative uh, descriptions of exercise Mm -hmm. and three realm, realms of quantitative descriptions of exercise right and you know within that then that there's sub breakouts from there mm -hmm. um but that was kind of the origin was was like do i actually have a model mm -hmm. and if i was going to be able to describe this model and make it as useful as possible to someone else reading it what is that process and and i've just continued to try to refine that model over time so i had this first Rethink the Big Patterns 1, mm -hmm. and since then I've created Rethink the Big Patterns 2 as a seminar, and since then I started actually combining both of them and turning it into a book, and then what I realized is that in trying to teach these seminars, there was no possible way that I could cover everything I wanted to cover in terms of showing all of the exercises, so then I made a video database mm -hmm. that at least included all of the exercises that are uh, listed in the seminar mm. yeah and you can then just show people via video without having to go through every single one of them live in the seminar exactly because mm -hmm. i'd rather have people understand the principles in the seminar mm -hmm. and be able to demonstrate to me that they understand the nature of the concept 
uh, as opposed to like, okay, we're going to now be in this pattern of hip dominant and we're going to be in this stance of front back staggered and mm -hmm. we're going to be in this plane of frontal plane. And here is exercise number one and two and three and four, it, because it would be like, okay, all we did was go through a thousand different exercises and see these things versus like when people at the end of the seminar mm -hmm. have a very good idea of the exact thought process of yeah. where to start people, where the end line is for people mm -hmm. and what the rules are that would guide you towards this activity should precede this activity. Uh, and, and that's what I really like to see at the end of those seminars because it, it's, it happens. And, and then I'm like, okay, people have the tools to be able to, to do the appropriate action at their facility with mm -hmm. the equipment that they have and with the population that they have. Yeah, they're not just prescribing an exercise for the sake of the exercise. They know that it's in this plane and it's in this movement pattern and then that's therefore the, they need an exercise that fits those for that individual and then they can choose from ones that they know how to implement and also have the equipment for. Exactly, yeah. So let's talk about that, I guess, for listeners who are, unaware of these things so far because you mentioned sort of planes of motion so let's yep. i guess give an overview of the frontal transverse sagittal plane and then i mean i guess you can go into a brief overview of your yeah. quantitative and qualitative metrics absolutely yeah i'd be happy to and and i wrote uh two articles that people can can check out too on this and they're at the the simply faster website mm -hmm. um uh s-i-m-p-l-i faster .com. right yeah okay um, so there, you know, just because I, I think that like, it'll be like, Hey, I'll, I'll be able to briefly touch on these things. But I, I tried to, the, those two articles, essentially I had taught rethinking the big patterns one a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And I honestly just wanted to try to write out the whole seminar right. in, in article format uh, so that people could actually just read it for free if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it'll be very helpful in adjunct to, to this to for people to be able to see that as well mm -hmm. and you can spend more time with it it's more detailed but um so so with that it's there's three levels of qualitative description of of trainable exercises mm -hmm. there's motor patterns there's stances of the feet that you can be in and there are planes of motion so i have 13 motor patterns that are considered to be big patterns mm -hmm. um, that don't include things like single joint uh, isolation movements, basically. Okay. Um, and, and those 13 patterns are breathing, uh, core exercises for the pelvis, core exercises for the thorax, throwing, triple extension, locomotion, change of direction, hip dominant movements, knee dominant movements, horizontal pushing, horizontal pulling, vertical pushing and vertical pulling. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't been able to think of another pattern that actually is trainable that, that exists, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and I always, at every seminar, I'm like, does anyone have anything else that they could add? Because I legitimately would want to add to it. And the, the literally the only one that I think might actually be possible to add to it, but it's the outside the scope of biomechanics is the mind. Mm -hmm. um, which I, I just do believe is, is a patterned beast um, and, and something that I, I, I would like to be able to include, but it doesn't fit within the scope of the model. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it, to me, is, it would be the 14th and maybe the most important. But um, you have those motor patterns, and then there are three stances that you can find yourself in uh, during the course of exercise mm -hmm. and they're uh, bilateral symmetrical where the feet are next to each other in kind of a ready position for athletics mm -hmm. and the weight is evenly distributed between those feet. There is a front back staggered stance, which would be associated with things like running or lunging or, or split jerk. Um, and then there is a lateral staggered stance where one foot is under your center of mass and the other foot is kicked out to the side like a kickstand. And it would look something like what would take place during like a lateral lunge mm -hmm. or ice, ice skating, for instance, uh, or when someone makes a cut in a shuttle run. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then for planes of motion, you have sagittal plane, frontal plane, and transverse. 
Uh, and I, I think that ultimately you can describe everything that could happen from a training perspective by it falling into some combination of those, those descriptors. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I enjoy the exercise sometimes with the seminar of uh, asking someone if they could just tell me what the last workout was that they coached someone. And, um, and typically... I might have to switch out for my headset. It's telling me that it's got battery low. We'll see how long it goes. <laughs> okay, you should no be worries. able to hear me without it. But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of like we usually go through a workout that someone wrote up and then mm-hmm. rename all the drills as being, you know, what pattern, what stance, and what plane did this thing actually fall into. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's kind of fun because people start to see like, oh, that's, this is, you know, it's, I think of it from the same perspective as, as Linnaeus's Systema Naturae. It's like, uh, you know, a, a lion, for instance, is like a mammal and a vertebrate. And uh, it's in like a Panthera uh, category. But the common name we use for it is lion. Mm. But if I wanted to describe it from a more specific uh, nomenclature standpoint, I also have this descriptor so that let's say I didn't communicate in the same language as someone else like I could still describe to them what this thing is because maybe someone that was you know born in a country very distant from where I am has no idea what the word lion means Mm -hmm. Um, and by just saying lion Mm -hmm. they're like I don't know what that means but if I described it for them with a language that they work in now Mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're like oh I know exactly what that thing is Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's the qualitative side. Mm-hmm. And then the quantitative side is broken into load, velocity, and duration. Mm-hmm. Um, and then within there, I have high loaded exercises, low load exercises, and moderate load exercises. And it's the same thing for the other realms as well. There's high velocity, low velocity, and moderate velocity, long duration, short duration, and, and moderate duration. And look, like I could have made many more branches of that. Like if, mm-hmm. you, if you're familiar with like Brian Mann's work with velocity-based training, he's going to have a lot more velocity. Um, but it's more simple with the the alf- alphabet that I've tried to create with, with less letters. Mm-hmm. Like if you have more letters, it's just a more complicated thing. Mm-hmm. And, and um, you know, so it's it, – and it generally accomplishes what you're looking for. So mm-hmm. when I'm thinking of trying to describe an exercise, I, I think of it from, from like, let's say it's a, it's a hip dominant movement done from a bilateral stance and it is in a sagittal plane and it's a moderate load, moderate velocity, moderate duration activity. Mm-hmm. You can understand that it's, it's some kind of a deadlift mm-hmm. that's probably done in bodybuilding style rep ranges. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's different compared to a uh, hip dominant movement that's done with low load at high velocity for long duration, because now I'm describing someone doing probably like a five minute kettlebell swing type of a, a you know, like a, like kettlebell training, mm-hmm. like competitive kettlebell athletes would. And the, and if I do a ton of uh, bodybuilding style, hip dominant movements, I'm going to come up with a different outcome as compared to uh, more high velocity hip dominant activity that a kettlebell practitioner would end up with mm-hmm. in terms of adaptations. Yeah. So to me, it was, it was all about like, is this thing different from that thing? Um, and, and one of the examples I use in there is that you'll oftentimes see incredible athletes that like, I, I bring up Charles Barkley, the basketball player a lot mm-hmm. because he was an amazing basketball player. But if you've ever seen him swing a golf club, it's, it's one of the least athletic things you'll ever see in your life. Right. And so it's like, you know, from the perspective of locomotion and change of direction and triple extension, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, elite inter- world class individual. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to, I, cause I would put, uh, like the throwing motor pattern also kind of includes like striking activities, mm-hmm. um, as well. Uh, so I would put like swinging a golf club kind of falling under throwing as a motor pattern. Mm-hmm. And just because you can do these other ones doesn't mean that you can do this one at all. And, yeah. and I feel like we've all seen that demonstrated like, wow, this guy is unbelievably strong, mm-hmm. but I put him into a front back stance 
and all of a sudden it's like they can barely stand up. They're wobbling all over the place. Mm -hmm. It's a different thing than this other thing. So it just tries to identify all of these very specific end buckets that people could potentially train themselves in mm -hmm. that are available. Like here is the totality of the playbook yep. that you have as a fitness professional. Now it's your job to actually determine which one of these buckets needs to be trained by a specific person. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because they provide different adaptations. And so depending on the person's goals, their function, what they need to do, because as you said, he's a fantastic basketball player and he has those adaptations. He doesn't need to swing a golf club. Right. I'm gonna Go ahead. <laughs> Hopefully you can still hear me here. Yeah, that's clear. It's all good. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so, so yeah. it comes down to their function, doesn't it? And then you can then choose mm -hmm. the exercises that you know are going to help that person adapt in the way that you, you well, you and they want them to. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to just see if I can up the volume here because it kind of, uh, it's, it's a little harder for me to hear you. These are always the things that happen where you're like, <laughs> you think you have everything figured out and you didn't charge, I didn't charge my headphones adequately enough before right. this. It's all good. But um, I might just bring you up and, and hear the question and then kind of switch back to, to being able to, to speak more to after that. Yeah, that's all good. I guess, I guess what I would say then is that, as you said, you've just designed the entire playbook for people to choose from. It's not a case of, okay, I need to do all of these movements now within my training program and, and try to fit them in somehow. Yeah, that's, that's a hundred percent correct. And, and you know, like I'll like, I'll bring up certain coaches a lot during the seminars and I, I'll bring up Derek Hansen quite a bit. Who's a, uh, you know, he's a long time track and field coach mm -hmm. and he works quite a bit with speed development with athletes. And, and I think of Derek, I, I, I oftentimes refer to him in, in my mind as the great gardener of the performance world. And when I think of someone that's a great gardener, they're not necessarily adding more plants and trees to the, the place that they're working in. Uh, instead, what they're doing oftentimes is they're pruning and they're removing things mm -hmm. and they get rid of everything that's unessential. And, and I think that that's so it's like, you know, sometimes people will look at this and they, they might see the number of exercises listed in, in the seminar or they might see the exercise database and they might see that there's like, you know, thousands of drills that are mm -hmm. available. Mm -hmm. And it's like, the point of it though is not necessarily to include a thousand drills in one particular person's program the point of it is that what you want to identify is that which is essential for people mm -hmm. and that which is non-essential for people and then to be able to actually provide exactly the right thing for them like you know i always think to myself like the american college of sports medicine they have a slogan that exercises medicine. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a, a, a catchy tagline. And, and when I first heard it, I was like, nah, okay. But the more I think about it, the more accurate I think it actually becomes. It's just that it's like, you have to think about what medicine is really all about. Mm -hmm. And medicine in many ways, like particularly modern medicine with, with doctors is about prescribing drugs. And you prescribe a drug because of the primary effect that it's looking to accomplish. And then once you identify, like, but, but you have different conditions that people might have, and they need different classifications or types of drugs dependent upon the thing that they actually have as their specific diagnosis. You know, I, I wouldn't give Prozac to someone who needs um, a painkiller. Like, mm -hmm. they, it's, a, it's the wrong uh, category of drug. So you first need to create within pharmacology, like the appropriate categories that are available. And then as a practitioner of medicine, you determine the exact needs of the person you're working with, because there's thousands and millions of kinds of drugs that exist, mm. but you need to pinpoint exactly what that individual needs. And from there, you then determine the dose that, that individual needs. And I, I think it's the same kind of thing with exercise as you need to figure out what exactly is the, because I almost look at it like a, a blood panel. If I have a blood panel, I can see what the deficiencies, deficiencies are, and I can think about the target areas that need to either be maintained or increased. And if I see that vitamin D, for instance, is deficient, 
I wouldn't just simply lump more vitamin C on the person. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to specifically target that and bring that area up to a level that's uh, appropriate. So uh, I have to give them exactly that thing, but I have to do it at the appropriate dose for them. Mm -hmm. And I might have to titrate that dose either up or down over time. Uh, and, and really it's a very similar kind of thing with, with exercise in my opinion. It's kind of like, I have a panel of movement and I have all these motor patterns. I have these stances and I have these directions that people can go into. Mm. And with that, I have to determine like, like from a gap analysis perspective, like what is it that this person has been doing? What is it that they're deficient in? And if they're deficient in something that's incredibly important for them, I need to provide them with that as a, as something that's actually given to them. Like they basically need this as like a drug provided for them, mm. a stimulus. But what is the, now the appropriate dose uh, for that? Like, and, and from the perspective of both intensity and volume to be able to bring the levels of that up to a certain degree. Mm. Um, so I, I oftentimes think of it like from, you know, of course I get someone doing med ball slams right outside this, this door. Now it's like shaking the whole room. But um, when I think of like, I can think of CrossFit as an easy example here mm. because they do a good, a, a good work. They do good work when it comes to, uh, you know, working with different loading zones. They do mm -hmm. heavy stuff. They do moderate load stuff. They do light stuff. They do different velocities. They mm. do different durations of activities, but almost everything that they do is done from a bilateral stance and it's done in the sagittal plane. You know, you can think of it as like from their workout perspective, it's like, Hey, we're going to warm up with this Olympic style lifting technique warm up, mm. And then once we're done with that, we're going to do Olympic lifts and we're going to front squat. And we're also then going to go into our conditioning part. And the conditioning part is going to be uh, wall ball throws and the rower. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, well, we have this incredible dose within the world of uh, bilateral stance, sagittal plane activities done mm -hmm. in, in, in largely kind of like knee dominant style movements. It's mm -hmm. like we Olympic lift, like the catch in many is, is kind of knee dominant. Then we front squatted after that. Then we use the rower. And then we use the wall ball. It's mm. like, you know, kind of knee dominant through and through. And the whole, the stance was the same. So in many ways I could be building like Mount Everest from the perspective of developing fitness within a bilateral stance and a sagittal plane, uh, you know, perspective, but I did nothing from a front back stance and I did nothing from a lateral stance and I did nothing in any other plane. Mm. So you know, and if that's all you're going to do, if you're going to do CrossFit, maybe you don't need to do those other stances and planes, but if you're going to use CrossFit as your training style yeah. and you are a professional football player for, you know, in, in England is what you would, you're, you're calling football is different from what we call football, yeah. but for your football, it's probably a inappropriate uh, style of training because mm. of how many moves they have to do that would involve being in like a lateral stance and how many things they have to do that would involve turning and twisting and, and, and other movements that are just not touched and developed whatsoever. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it really, for me, is just all about trying to get people to think about uh, the nature of movement. And once there's a category for something, uh, then all of a sudden there's like a box. It's like, show me that you can kind of think inside the box first and you mm -hmm. can color by numbers. And then once you're fully aware of the inside of the box and you've colored in all the appropriate numbers, now you can be someone that can be an outside the box thinker and you can create your own pictures and portraits and landscapes and whatever else it is you want to do as an artistic expression type of coach. Yeah. But yeah. In the beginning, it's kind of helpful when someone just provides framework for you mm. so that you can work from there. Definitely. Well, great. Pat, you know, I, I appreciate that your, uh, your time is running out. Um, and I think you've given a, a great amount of value. We'll have to uh, get you back on. Um, where, can, uh, where can people find more about you and more about what you do? Sure. And, uh, you know, it's always like, um, 
you know, I apologize for any technical glitches and things. But it's, just, <laughs> it's you know, all good, story. Uh, you know, it'll work out for the most part, I think. And the like, I I I used to have a, a website that was kind of working, but the the people that were that were sort of maintaining that website, they're onto different projects. So don't bother going to the website associated with me. It's not gonna reach me i'm not gonna so i tried to just for right now consolidate everything on instagram so mm -hmm. you can find me at uh dr pat davidson on instagram there's it's dr period pat davidson and um you know through there you can find a link to all the big projects that i'm doing in in my instagram bio mm -hmm. and people can always just uh send me a message right through instagram i i you know, I'm not someone that won't respond to your messages. Like I, I interact with people. Great. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Feel free to, to do that. And um, I'm really looking forward to the, to the UK rethinking the big pattern seminar. That's going to be at Joel Proskowitz's place in London. Yeah. And knowing that you're going to be there is, is super cool because it's always great to meet people in person after yeah. doing something like this. Yeah, it'd be great. Looking forward to it. Thank you again. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.